Good morning. Yep, so thank you, David, for leading us this morning and for reading Judges chapter four. So we're actually, uh, we're continuing a series that Jesse started last week in, in Judges and looking at, yeah, Israel's history through this period. And uh, as Jesse mentioned last week, uh, there's a, there is an expected sort of pattern that we see repeated over and over again. But what's really unexpected is, is that the way that God is merciful through that, through that cycle of, that constant cycle of people turning away, his people turning their back on God. He, he's merciful through that time, and that's a real excitement. And so whilst we see this expected pattern, we also see God work in really unexpected ways, and that's what really is really exciting for us to look at this morning. How does God work in ways that we don't expect to bring about his marvelous purposes? And it's amazing that he does that. He's so merciful to do that over and over again for people that continually forget him and reject him. So yeah, we are looking at Judges 4 and 5, and the central character of this is Deborah. My clicker will work. There you go. So Deborah is the central character, but we actually find within this uh, account, in Judges 4 and 5, there's actually a whole bunch of characters going on there, lots of different names that David had to read through for us. Thanks, Dave. Um, so Judges 4 and 5 is really their parallel account. So Judges 4, as we just had read, is like the narrative or prose account. And Judges 5 is actually a song that Deborah and Barak sung together, wrote together and sung together, which really recounts the narrative side of it. So they're a, they're a parallel pair. They go together. We're just going to look at um, both details from both, because whilst chapter four gives us a lot of detail, chapter five does have a little bit of insight to add in as well. So we're gonna look at both, but we're not gonna look at the whole, the whole two pas- chapters together. We're just looking at a few little details across both passages. So the central character is Deborah, and she's a, a leader, a judge, a prophetess of Israel. Her leadership is already established at this time, The children of Israel, as we read, come to her for judgment on matters that they can't settle themselves. Another character that we heard about was Barak. He comes from way up north in uh, Kadesh, in Naphtali. It's right by the Sea of Galilee. And Barak is summoned by Deborah to appear before her in Ephraim, and he's given the responsibility to lead Israel into battle. Another character that's introduced is Jabin, the king of Canaan. He lives even further up north, beyond the the Sea of Galilee in Hazor. The next character is Sisera. He's the commander of Jabin's army. So he's the commander of the Canaanite army. And he lives in Harasheth. I won't say the whole, I'll cheat David and I'll just say he's from Harasheth, uh, which is also up north. And I've got a bit of a map, I'll show you later where that is. Uh, He controls the Canaanite army, which includes some pretty modern technology, uh, 900 iron chariots. So we'll talk more about what, what, that, like, what that's all about later as well. And then the last one I want to introduce, the main character, is Heber and his wife, Jael. So they're Kenites, and they reside near Kadesh as well, which is, so they're neighbors, effectively, to Barak. And then we also learn that there's friendly relations between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and this uh, family, the Kenite family, Heber's family, who are living up in Kadesh. All right, here's a bit of a map. I don't know if you can see that very well. It's a bit of a struggle, really. Um, I've got a few little red highlights there. I hope you can see them. I've got a laser pointer, but it gets washed out, so that's no good either. So hopefully you can see that. So down south, in the the little bit just north of the Dead Sea, so at the very bottom of the screen, uh, is where Deborah is situated. So she's right down... Uh, in the hill country of Ephraim, and she says that she's between Bethel and Ramah. So if you can see that red highlight, that's where she is right now in our story. And then way up north, just uh, to the west, southwest of the Sea of Galilee is where Barak is. So you can see there's quite a distance between them. And then even further north, way at the top of the picture, is Hazor. So this is where Jabin, the king of the Canaanites, is. And then way out west, which is uh, in modern uh, Haifa today, if you can see that, where, Mot, where, Mount, where Mount Carmel is, um, you can see, and the Kaishon River as well, that's where Harasheth is, roughly. We're not sure exactly, but we think it's out that way. 
somewhere south of the Kishon River. And that's important that it's south of the Kishon River and that'll become obvious later. That's one of those unexpected details that we're, that we're gonna look at. So that's where everybody's situated, just to get it right in your head. You know, there's, they're not all just hanging around close by, they're all spread out all over the place. Uh, and then we've also mentioned the Kenite, Heber. Heber, uh, as I mentioned, he's back over on the Sea of Galilee in Kadesh or nearby, um, right near where the, where, um, forgotten his name now, Barak is. Yep, and then the battle that we've, that we've heard about takes place around Mount Tabor there, which is just there, uh, right in the border between Zebulun and Issachar, just again, southwest of the Sea of Galilee. So that hope that gets it all right in your head, where everything is geographically. All right, so we talked about this expected pattern, and this is what Jesse introduced to us last week. So we can see that it starts, uh, starts here, as it starts in verse one. You know, Israel does evil. This is the repeated pattern that we see over and over again. So we see it repeated right here, don't we, in verse one. The Israelites, after Ehud died, the Israelites do evil in the eyes of the Lord. And then God punishes, that's the next part of the, the cycle, God punishes Israel. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, the king of Canaan. And then what happens next? Then Israel cries out to God. And we see in verse three exactly that, don't we? That because of the oppression from, from Sisera and the 900 iron chariots for 20 years, finally Israel cries to God for help. And after they cry to help, we see this pattern continuing that God provides a deliverer. He raises up Deborah, a prophetess. And we see that in verse four. And then God delivers Israel. Spoiler alert, in case you didn't know, God delivers Israel. So we read that in, in chapter, uh, verse 23. On that day, God subdued Jabin, the Canaanite king, before the Israelites. And then the last part of the cycle is, is that the Israelites enjoy peace. And we read at the end of those two accounts in chapter five, right at the end, that the land enjoyed peace for 40 years. So that's the cycle. That's what Jesse said we're expecting to see. And, we, and just as we expected to see it, we did see it exactly like that. But as I mentioned, Whilst there's a lot of uh, things that we expect to see, it's amazing, isn't it, that as I said, as I introduced at the beginning, that God, despite this cycle, I mean, if, if this was us, if this was our kids doing this, how long would we put up with it before we say, you're a lost cause kid, yeah? I don't know. But God, over and over again, puts up with this same cycle, this rebellion, and he's merciful, and he works in unexpected ways to bring around bring around uh, a miraculous outcome. And that, they're the things we're gonna look at today, the unexpected things. So the first unexpected thing is the unexpected leader, Deborah. And whilst it's not unexpected that, that, that a woman was able to perform the roles of judge and prophetess, that's not unexpected at all, but it is unexpected from this time, you know, this time in, uh, in history, that all Israel would have actually accepted her leadership, her role as a as a judge and actually as a prophet. It's interesting to note that she is the only judge, male or female, that also has the office of, of prophet as well. But yet, even though it's surprising and unexpected that this uh, woman would be, of to, would be leading and be a prophet, we actually read in this account, very here, that the Israelites did in fact accept her because we read that they came to her to have their disputes decided. It's also interesting to note that out of all the main characters, all the main judges that we're gonna see over the next five weeks, Deborah is the only one that we don't actually have an origin story or a backstory. We don't actually see how she came to be in the position of judge. All the others, we get, it, we get a, a, an insight into how they came into that position. But here, the author decides that it's not a really important point for us to know. But however, we can confidently assume that God has clearly worked through her because of the way that the Israelites have all accepted her. They've embraced her. She says here, she's leading at that time and she's holding court and all Israel come to her. So it's not an important detail. It'd be really exciting if we knew the backstory. I'm sure it's an amazing story, but, but we don't know it. It's not, not really needed for us to, to know according to the author. So we have an unexpected leader but we also have unexpected instructions coming from Deborah. So 
God through Deborah. She, you know, she summons Barak from way up north. He comes down to come and meet with her. And God gives a very specific plan through, through Deborah to Barak. And this instruction is very unexpected. It's an instruction for Barak to amass a force of 10,000 men on Mount Tabor where Sisera will be given into their hands. And this, this is an unexpected instruction because for 20 years they've been cruelly oppressed by, by this guy and they are outmatched. You know, they, don't, they don't have the weaponry that, that these guys have. They're not hardened, battle-hardened, well-trained guys. You know, these, are, these are just normal men outnumbered and um, outmuscled by, you know, by a force that has vastly superior weaponry. And I'm talking specifically about those 900 iron chariots. It's an unexpected instruction to ask Barak to go and do this because from a worldly point of view, it's a futile exercise. He's gonna be defeated for sure. Here's a bit of a picture, maybe a slight exaggeration about you know, the difference between Barak and Sisera, but I don't think it's actually too far off the mark. So in this one, you know, what do we expect here in this picture? Who would you expect would be to victorious? Of course, you'd think the tank, wouldn't you? So maybe a slight exaggeration, but chariots are a mo- you know, and not a modern day, they're an ancient equivalent of the tank. And they're you know, very intimidating, uh, very powerful. You imagine that you know, coming through a rank of uh, infantry. It's gonna make a mess, isn't it? It's gonna be a real problem and hard to handle. And so maybe we don't know exactly what the iron chariots look like, but they would have uh, carried multiple soldiers, maybe not four as is shown here, but at least a a couple, one to drive, one to uh, shield, and one to attack. But no matter what's going on in the back there, just the horses alone are gonna wreak havoc through um, an army, an opposing army who don't have anywhere near the the same technology. It's a strange way to talk about chariots, isn't it? Technology, but it was actually vastly superior technology at the time. So these chariots were overlaid with iron. So this was a whole other level from the previous chariots. Um, So multiple soldiers, they were formidable and intimidating, and yeah, they would have, um, yeah, any, yeah, it was a sizable force. It wasn't just the 900 chariots that um, Sisera controlled as well. He'd actually had an army as well. So it, I don't think it was a fair fight. That's why I'm saying it's an unreasonable, not an unreasonable, what am I, what am I saying? Not, it's an unexpected instruction for Deborah to say, go, go amass this force on, on Mount Tabor. But despite the unexpected instruction to go and get on Mount Tabor with these 10,000 men, God does actually give an assurance. He says, I'm actually gonna be at work. I'm gonna be involved as well. I'm gonna lure Sisera with his chariots and troops to the Kaishon River and give him into your hands. So that's a good encouragement. And now, as we look at the next unexpected incident um, or outcome, we can understand why God was giving this instruction. We don't actually read about it in chapter four, but in chapter five, that's some of this extra detail I was talking about, we read that there was unexpected weather. So in Judges four versus, uh, Judges five, sorry, verses four and five, we can read, when you, Lord, went out from Seir, when you marched from the land of Edom and the earth shook, the heavens poured, the clouds poured down water. Then we also read a bit later in the same chapter, from the heavens the stars fought, from their courses they fought against Sisera. The river Kaishon swept them away, the age old river, the river Kaishon. So we get a bit more insight here, don't we? It wasn't just that this force of 10,000 on Tabor with you know, Barak and Deborah leading was enough to actually overcome this, this force of Sisera, it wasn't. We can see that there was an unexpected event that occurred, it was the weather. God was at work powerfully to actually bring a sudden and unseasonable, unseasonable, seasonable, I can't speak, unseasonable season storm to actually create, again, create a real big problem. If you think about it, Sisera, as I showed you in that map, actually is a local of this region. It's not like he's a foreigner. It's not like he doesn't understand. No, he's living by that river, the Kaishon River, and he, he's been there 20 years, so he knows 
the conditions, he knows the optimum battlegrounds, he knows the optimum places for crossing the river. He's been sucked in effectively by God and he's been, he's been lured in as, as the verse said and he's been caught out by nothing other than a miracle. God actually bringing tons and tons of water that's actually created a big boggy marsh on his nice level battlefield that he was expecting to have and his chariots are now next to useless. They, they can't manoeuvre, they can't move. Some of them, you know, we read that um, Sisera himself abandons his chariot. He gets down from it and flees on foot. Others, we read, try to flee and get back home to Harasheth, but we read that they were overcome by, the, by Barak's forces. So we see that, you know, that God intervening in this marvellous way has really um, made this, this high-tech weaponry, he's negated it, and it's now, it's now a fair fight, I guess you could say. So... So we find that Barak is now chasing, I've actually got a map here, again, this is gonna be really hard to see. So what you should be able to see there, but you can't, is what's, all, what's going on with all the forces. So I'll just explain it, right? So, so if you can imagine, uh, Sisera is south of that Kaishan River, and he's got word, we read in here that someone has given him word that the Israelites are, f are massing on Mount Tabor, we think it probably came from Heber, the guy that lives in Kadesh, right near Barak as well, Heber the Kenite. We think he somehow got word to Harasheth that the, the Israelites are amassing on, on Mount Tabor. And he's going, okay, and this is my opportunity. He's got his chariots, he's, he's amassed his forces south of the Kaishan River, just near Megiddo, and he's crossed that river with all his forces. And then the rains come, and then he's trapped. He can't, get, he can't get back home, and all his chariots are all bogged in the mud, and so he's really in big trouble. And then we see what happened. As soon as it starts raining, Deborah says, go, the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. And they go down that mountain, and there they are, you know, just trapped. Some of them try to make a run for it, and some of them go into the river, and they get swept away. That's what we read in uh, chapter five. Those who tried to get across the river to get back to Harasheth, they... they you know, despite the water flowing, they thought we better give it a shot because we're dead for sure if, uh, if Barak catches up with us. They went in the river and they got swept away. So it, it's another unexpected event, isn't it? The weather. And that was really what gave the decisive victory. That was what made the whole difference. Waiting for my clicker to work. You might have to do that, Paul. It's not working. So we don't actually know where Sisera abandoned his chariot, but we know that he did, and we know that he made his way across to the east and up to the Sea of Galilee area to find himself um, heading towards Heber the Kenite's tent. He probably thought that's a good idea, it will be safe because I've got an ally there. There's an al I know that uh, there's an alliance between my king, Jabin, and the family of Heber the Kenite. So I'll get there. I'll be able to rest there and then probably take the 35 kilometer journey back up to Hazor, further north after I'm rested. And so the next unexpected point to raise is we have an unexpected ally. So we have unexpected leader, an unexpected instruction, unexpected weather, and now we have the final piece of the puzzle, an unexpected ally. So in Judges 4, we read from verse 17 that Sisera, he fled and he went, made his way to the tent of Jael, who is the wife of Heber, the Kenite. So this raises an interesting question, who on earth are the Kenites? Now, you might be surprised to know, this is actually the third time that the Kenites are referenced in the book of Judges. So let's do, this really got me intrigued. So I actually got, went down a bit of a rabbit hole for a couple of days and trying to figure out who are the Kenites. So I'll share a little bit with you. So the Kenites are actually related to Moses' father and Lord Jethro. He was a Kenite. Uh, when the Israelites were actually wandering through the desert um, after the Exodus, after they left Sinai, um, we actually read this in Numbers 10. So Moses is actually talking to Jethro's son, Habab. He actually says, you know, we're, we're about to leave as God's instructed us to go into the land that God's going to give us. And he's gonna, God has promised to give it to us. And, he, and so Moses says to Hobab, you know, come with us and we'll treat you well for the Lord has promised good things to Israel. 
So Hobab is Jethro's son. He's a Kenite, right? Straight away, Hobab says, no, nah, I don't want to come with you. I want to go home. But Moses insists. He says, please do not leave us. You know where we sh- You know, we, he's really saying we need your help. Moses is saying we need your help. You know, because these guys are t- tent-dwelling people. He says, you know where we should camp in the wilderness, and you can be our eyes. If you come with us, we'll share with you whatever good things the Lord gives us. So these are the Kenites. We, we don't actually read in Numbers what um, Hobab's answer was, but we can guess pretty well, pretty accurately, because we read in Judges, this is the first reference to the Kenites in the, in the book of Judges, where we read that the descendants of Moses' Moses's father-in-law, the Kenite, went up from the city of Palms, that's Jericho, and they went up with the people of Judah to live among the inhabitants of the desert of Judah. So we see that there's these Kenites still hanging around, and they're part of the, um, you yeah, know, they're still sort of living with the, the clan of Judah. But it, there's more. So a couple of hundred, if you skip a couple of hundred years forward to the time of the monarchy, we see King Saul. He actually um, was about to attack the Amalekites, and, but before he did, he actually sent word to the Kenites who were living amongst the Amalekites. And he said to them, go away, leave the Amalekites so that I do not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. They've got long memories, haven't they? This is hundreds of years later. Saul knew all about the Kenites and he knew that Moses had insisted that Hobab come with with the the children of Israel as they came up out of Sinai. And so this is hundreds and hundreds of years later and and there's still this affinity, this bond between the Kenites and the Israelites, even way, this is way after our account. And to take it further, just to finish off with this, who are the Kenites, this is, I found remarkable. This is actually from Chronicles. This is actually the genealogy of all the clans that came up, that exist. And this is from the clan of Judah, that the Kenites are actually listed as the descendants. They're actually listed in the genealogy of Judah and his son, Caleb. So it goes to show they're not actually physical descendants, but it goes to show that they've lived together so long and shared such a, a bond that they're actually listed as, you know, in the genealogy. It's, a, it's amazing. So why did I go into all that detail? Because we read in cha- verse 11 of our chapter, chapter 4, that Heber the Kenite had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and he pitched his tent way up north in Kadesh. He's the Heber that we talked about. So at some point, not too long ago, probably when the other Kenites were in Jericho that we read about in chapter one of Judges and they went down south, this guy, Heber, for whatever reason, we don't know, it's not recorded, he's decided to split up from his, his group to leave Judah, to leave the other Kenites and go up north. We don't know why, we can speculate, one commentator said it's because Kenites are known as metal workers, and perhaps he thought he'd have a lucrative business working for Sisera you know, with all the iron chariots. It's a possible, because we do read that he did have an alliance with Jabin, the king of Hazor, so there's definitely some relationship there. It could have all been business. We don't know for sure. But it's a really important point to, to, for us to recognize this relationship, this long, long relationship between the Kenites and the Israelites. All right, so then we, we continue reading about this unexpected ally. So we read from verse 18 that Jael went out to meet Sisera. So Sisera has been defeated. He's probably been walking now for at least 30 kilometers, maybe even longer, depending on when he, where he got off his chariot. So it's a, he's, been, he's exhausted And he's made his way into Kadesh and he's happened across the uh, tent of Jael and she invites him in. Jael is Heber's wife, the Kenite, right? So she's a Kenite. She says, come my Lord, come right in, don't be afraid. So he entered her tent and she covered him with a blanket. Then he said, I'm thirsty, give me some water. And she actually was a great host, gave him some milk and she covered him up. Then he asked her to stand in the doorway and she did that. He said, if someone comes, say, if, if anyone's in there, say to them no. 
So she agreed, and he, was, he felt very safe and secure, so he had a good sleep after being exhausted, I'm sure, after all that battle and all that, all that walking to escape to Kadesh. And then we, read, then we read what happens, don't we? Once he's asleep, Heber's wife, Jael, picks up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he was laying fast asleep, exhausted, and she killed him in quite a, a gruesome fashion. We don't know what Jael's motivation was, but I think from what I just told you about the Kenites, I think you could probably make a pretty good guess, couldn't you? We don't really know her backstory at all. We can speculate. The one that I like the most is that you know, when, when the Kenites were living so closely with, the, with the, the clan of Judah and they were listed in the genealogy that, and there's this long-term relationship, there's probably a lot of intermarrying going on. She herself may have been an Israelite. We don't know. I'm only speculating. <clears throat> but we do know because of her long association the Kenites' long association and friendship with, with the Israelites, that no doubt was what actually motivated her to do this act. So we have an unexpected ally. Who would have thought, out of all the tents that uh, you know, Jabin, um, Sisera could have entered, he's entered the one tent that has an ally, an unknown ally with Israel, with a, 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 a relationship that extends back centuries that is intimate and close. It's a real, it's nothing other than a, a miracle, isn't it? It's a testimony to God's infinite wisdom that he was, and his ability to bring about victory through such strange circumstances. Sisera, in any other circumstances, most likely would have escaped. He probably would have made it to Hazor safe and sound and rebuilt his army and, and continued to oppress the Israelites. So God has unexpectedly delivered a miraculous way of escape through the unexpected leader through the unexpected instruction and through unexpected weather and lastly, this unexpected ally. It's, a, it's miraculous that all the, all the ducks that God, God has got lined up in a row to bring about this, uh, this wonderful victory. And whilst at the beginning, I did start by saying there's this cycle and we expect that there will be God, you know, God will give a victory, even though we expect that, the victory itself is definitely unexpected, isn't it? Israel were victorious. Despite their obvious disadvantage, despite Sisera's obvious strength and uh, all, all his advantages that he had, because God was intimately involved, they were victorious. So God delivered through that very specific plan that he gave through Deborah, didn't he? He detailed everything, where the battle should be on Mount Tabor, how big the force should be, 10,000, and even who should fight. God was so specific and because he was so specific, and because Deborah and Barak obeyed, all the above details you know, about going to Mount Tabor, the size of the force, and where the force should come from, it's because of this detail that Sisera was even lured into the battle in the first place. Because he knew that they were on Mount Tabor, because he had word sent to him. Because he knew that terrain. Because he thought, the Israelites are sitting ducks. He was, lured into the, he was lured into a false sense of security to go and attack, and he did. But we, we also know, don't we, the unexpected victory came because God intervened, because he trapped Sisera and all his chariots because of the water that he brought. The, the rain and the Kishon River became an impassable raging torrent of water because of God. And then the victory came also because of, by providence, he placed an ally in Kadesh, in Kael, Heber's wife. It's amazing. God is amazing. The unexpected victory came, pure, of course, because of God, but also because, because the Israelites obeyed. Deborah and Barak had faith. They actually had faith to obey these unexpected instructions. Despite what they might have thought was possible or logical, they obeyed. They went from Ephraim all the way up north. They amassed that force of 10,000. They went to Mount Tabor. Who knows what was going on in their minds exactly because whatever they thought was you know, worldly possible from the world's standards, they went believing that God would do what he said. But still, it's an amazing 
testimony to their faith that they went in the face of insurmountable odds. They were outmatched against this 20-year veteran, Sisera, with far superior weapons. But Barak believed God's promise that he would deliver Sisera, and so he went. And this is even more astounding that, that Barak went when you read about the fact that Deborah actually told him beforehand that the honor for this fight won't go to you. It'll actually go to someone else. So, so he, if you think about it from Barak's point of view, he's got this ominous foe, seems like an, an insurmountable force, and no obvious personal gain for himself. He's not even gonna get the honor from the victory, but yet he still goes. And this is why I think we read in Hebrews 11, he's listed in the heroes of faith, Barak is, because he went. He went and, yeah, in the face of such opposition, he went, believing that God would deliver, even though everything else told him, you're a sitting duck, mate, you're in big trouble. He still went. And so we see this unexpected victory came because of God and the way he unexpectedly intervened in all those different ways and because the people, the Israelites, had faith to trust God to do the unexpected. It's amazing. So what's the encouragement for us? Encouragement is that this, this is our God. The God of Barak and Deborah is the same today as he was back then, and he still works in the exact same ways. And we can still expect the unexpected, just as we've talked about today and just as Jesse mentioned last week. We can expect the unexpected from God, Despite what our eyes may see and what our brains may be telling us is the expected outcome, let us no longer live by sight, but rather by faith in our great God's ability to do the miraculous, to do the impossible. That's the encouragement for us. Just like Barak, don't assume that what we perceive to be the likely outcome is inevitable and therefore feel that we should ignore God's call or instruction because we're frightened, because we, we can't see a possible way through. We can't see a path that's gonna lead to success or victory. That's not what we're called to do. We're not called to, to see the path to victory. We're called to trust in the God that calls us to follow him by faith. So expecting the unexpected is not a catchphrase. We use it like that, but it's not a catchphrase. We can genuinely rely on God and expect God to miraculously work out unexpected outcomes all the time. It's not the, it doesn't have to be the exception, it can be the norm. Just like we've seen him do today for Deborah and Barak, we can expect him to do the unexpected. No matter how impossible things may seem, how improbable, how illogical or opposite to every plausible conclusion that you've come up with, no matter how difficult or untried or unproven, if God has called you, then you can obey, assured of the fact that he can, he can work things out through his marvelous, through any marvelous unexpected solution that will bring not only victory, but also lead us into knowing him better and being able to praise him as we see his creativity, his amazing power in devising such elaborate, clever plans of, you know, and through these, he's revealing his perfect power, his perfect knowledge, and his perfect timing. This is our God. And he's saying to us, you can trust me. I can do things that you never expect. So when God calls, he commands or instructs us. No longer do we need to look at all the physical reasons why you can't obey. We might think, you know, defeat is certain because I'm not dot, 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 you know, fill in the blank. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not tall enough, whatever. <laughs> what is the point they'll never accept? These are all the objections we put up when God calls us. And maybe he, maybe he doesn't call us to these big things because maybe we're not listening to him in the little things. And even in the little things, when we trust him in the little things, we can see him work. I guess what we're saying is, is no, more, no more excuses saying I can't do it because it's now faith in God to do the unexpected through those who are weak and broken. So we can expect the unexpected. God will provide what's necessary. This is a good verse, Isaiah 55. If you need some encouragement, you know, this is what God says. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. 
As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. It's an encouragement for us to remember that, yeah, maybe we can't see a way through. We can't devise in our mind any possible way that this command that God has given us could lead to victory. But we don't know things the way that God knows them. But we do know that we can trust him. That's the point. We can trust him. The God of Deborah and Barak is our God. He was directly involved and at work in so many different ways to bring this victory about. He provided solutions and miraculous outcomes every step of the way. That's the question for us and for you individually to ask yourself, can you, can I trust him to do the same for us today? It's an interesting question. Can we, can we rely on him? Has he actually proven himself to you, to you to the degree that you will actually entrust yourself to him fully? Has he actually done enough to, to earn your trust? My animation was backwards there, sorry. Has he done enough to earn your trust? That's an interesting thing to think about. How much more confidence in God do you need before you'll be willing to say, yes, Lord, I trust you. I don't see the way ahead, but I trust that you do. I'll follow you. Do you trust him enough to give him control, complete control of your life? Consider these words from chapter five of our passage. This is, uh, what from, this is from Deborah and Barak's song. They said, when the princes in Israel take the lead, when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. That's what, that's what they did. They willingly offered themselves and it brought praise to the Lord. This verse, thinking of this verse from Judges 5, brings my mind straight away to Romans 12, similar call, talking about willingly offering yourself. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Just as Barak and all the Israelites you know, offered themselves willingly to God, they, trusted, they entrusted themselves to him. That's what we're called to. Exactly the same thing, to say, God, I trust you. I trust you more than myself. I trust your will, your plan. I wanna give my life as a living sacrifice to you. No longer I live, but you live through me. That's what Romans 12 is calling us to. God wants our lives, but not because he's got a big ego or his selfish pride. It's actually for our good, for the good of, and for the good of the community in which we live. A life in God's hands will be used for miraculous outcomes. That the life that awaits the one who fully puts their trust in him is a true, truly remarkable life. That's the kind of life that I want. I wanna be used by God, just like Deborah and Barak. So the question for myself is why? Why would I be afraid to let him have control when he's proven himself over and over again to be able to do things beyond our understanding, beyond what we could ever imagine or perceived in the future. But here in this account, even in just this account, we have more than enough to be able to say God is faithful. He is trustworthy. We can entrust our lives to him. We can yield to him, willingly offer ourselves so he can direct us in his will to use us for his purposes, to glorify his name. That's what I want. Why do I struggle? I don't know. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that you do, you work in so many unexpected ways, despite our constant rebellion. This same, we, we fall into this same pattern that the Israelites do over and over again. Lord, but you are merciful. You don't treat us as we deserve, Lord. You work in miraculous ways to to reveal your power, to reveal your glory. Lord, we pray that today as we leave that you would help us to reflect on what you have revealed about yourself today, Lord, that you are able to work through remarkable ways, through unexpected allies, through unexpected events, through unexpected people to bring about your purposes, Lord. We pray that you would help us, Lord, to grow in faith, to trust you more than we trust ourselves, to say, yes, I can't see the way ahead, but I can trust that God knows. And I won't live by sight, I'll live by faith. Lord, help us to give our lives to you as living sacrifices for your glory, we ask it, Lord, through Jesus' name, amen.